making pumpkin lasagna. It's super hearty and cheesy. It's got crispy, salty bacon, loads of bitter chard, and it's all held together by a creamy, no-cook pumpkin sauce. To start, I'm crisping up bacon. Bacon and pumpkin together are a match made in savory heaven. Now that I've rendered my bacon fat, I'm gonna use it to cook up my veggies. I have two big onions that are thinly sliced. A good pinch of salt will help them soften down. I'll cook these just for about six to eight minutes until they're soft. These are smelling really nice. I'll add a few bunches of chopped bitter chard and let it cook down. Okay, another pinch of salt will help draw the moisture out and allow it to soften. I love a veggie packed lasagna because everything is good when it's underneath a blanket of noodles and cheese. I'll grate in some fresh nutmeg for warmth and then let these veggies drain while I put together my other layers. Time for the star of this lasagna, the pumpkin. It comes from a can. This sauce is so easy. I'll thin it out with one cup of low sodium chicken stock and three quarters of a cup of heavy cream for added richness and a tablespoon of chipotle's and adobo sauce, which are so smoky and a little bit spicy, but not overly so. Because in order for pumpkin to really lean savory, it's gotta have something smoky, something salty, the bacon, and something bitter, the chard. Salt, a teaspoon of it. <laughs> I'll mix this together. So that's it, I'll do the cheese layer now. I'll start with one and a half pounds of whole milk ricotta. You gotta have that fluffy layer in a lasagna. I'll crack in an egg so that this layer can set, and then half a cup of grated parm and some freshly chopped parsley. Lasagna sometimes uses a few more bowls than I want it to, but then when I have a gigantic casserole of lasagna in my fridge for days after eating it, it's all worth it. Okay, got all my components ready. It's time to assemble. First layer is a cup of sauce to prevent any noodles from sticking to the bottom of the pan. And top with three no-boil lasagna noodles. And then I'll spread on a third of the ricotta mixture. I wanna cover the entirety of the noodle. That's the secret to no-boil noodles, is you really gotta cover them with stuff so that they actually absorb moisture and get cooked. A third of my veggies. Mm. Chard smells good. And a third of the bacon, which I'll just crumble all over. Bacon and chard together are really nice. These will punctuate the bites with crispy saltiness. And then one cup of mozzarella cheese. And it's important to have the mozzarella go all the way to the edge so that it gets crispy. Okay, I'll repeat these layers two more times and then finish with noodles, the rest of the pumpkin sauce, loads of mozzarella cheese, and Parmesan. Oh yeah, I'll cover it up with foil. And then this will go in at 425 degrees for 30 minutes, and then I'll uncover it and bake for an additional 15 minutes until it gets golden and bubbly on top. I think I'm hearing that cheese bubble. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh my goodness. Oh yeah. All of the brown cheese splotches. I'll finish with a sprinkle of crushed red pepper for an extra hit of spiciness. I think I'm just gonna risk burning my mouth because it smells too good not to taste it. I'm going for a crispy edge. It's gooey, it's cheesy. That little sweetness from the pumpkin is so good. Holy pumpkin. I'm making paprikash. It's a Hungarian dish, and it is sort of a stew that's rich and creamy, and that paprika gives it that smokiness. Mm. I start with half a stick of butter, and then add loads of onions and carrots, and then I dump in some garlic, and three whole tablespoons of sweet paprika, a little cayenne for heat, and then some tomato paste, and then I start building my roux, so I'll get some flour in there to help my sauce thicken. It's gonna be a little boozy as I pour in some wine. So it adds that little bit of acidity, 
This is Bessie. She was Grandma Marie's, and I love her because she is a workhorse. The only thing I don't love about her is how tiny these coils are and how the oven can barely fit a turkey. I'm looking for a bigger oven, definitely something that's in the islands that I can face out and we can talk. I see that you like to cut on butcher block. I love butcher blocks. I love the feel of them. I would love to find a way to divide the kitchen between a couple of different countertops. I think keeping the island itself all in butcher block. Okay. And then maybe what you do is just like introduce the quartz, maybe along the sink area. Yes. It's really gonna evolve around how you work and what appliances that you're gonna use. Right. I was thinking that an oven could be a nice place for a pop of color. Mm, I love that idea. I add some chicken stock, just a little bit at a time so that it thickens up into that rich, creamy sauce, and then finish the sauce with heavy cream to get it ultra rich. I stir in some chicken and let that cook, and then add some bright green peas, and then cover the whole thing in tots, and bake it until the tots are golden and crispy. Awesome. I definitely just worked up a huge appetite. I'm starving. So did I. Hot, hot dish. It is quintessentially Midwestern. It's cream soup, ground beef, and covered in tots. Everything you could ever want on a cold day. I just love it. In my skillet here, I've got it heating over medium high. I'll soften up my shallots in just a drizzle of neutral oil. Put a pinch of salt. And let these soften. Smells good in here already. I'll get the beef. I've got two pounds of ground beef. I'll season this with a teaspoon of kosher salt and then break it up with my spoon as it browns. It's just about there. I'll add 12 ounces of frozen green beans and they'll thaw almost immediately. I like green beans in this hot hot dish because flavor is mild and allows everything to just blend together. So when you get a spoonful of it, it's just pure comfort. I'll get this off the heat and get my casserole dish. I've accumulated so many casserole dishes since moving here. I'll transfer this mixture to the dish using a slotted spoon. It's important to make sure that there is not too much moisture in a hot dish because that could cause the tater tots to sink and get soggy. I'll drain and wipe out this skillet and then make my cream soup mixture. I'll turn the heat back onto medium and melt a quarter cup of unsalted butter. So I'll start to build a roux now, which is gonna thicken up my chicken stock and that'll be the stand-in for the canned cream soup. I'll add a half a cup of all-purpose flour and whisk it in with the butter. I just want it to toast a little bit so the flour flavor cooks off. I'm adding in a bit of beer, which will add some acidity and some depth. I figured us Midwesterners won't mind a little beer in the hot dish. So now that this is whisked in, I'll gradually add two and a quarter cups of low sodium chicken stock. And the key to the smoothest sauce is to add the liquid gradually and to whisk continuously. Okay, so once I can see the tracks of my whisk, one more addition. There we go, that's getting thick. And now half a cup of heavy cream will add important richness. I'll flavor this with some freshly grated nutmeg, a teaspoon of fresh thyme leaves for subtle herbaceousness, and salt and pepper. The combination of flavors smells so nice. Okay, this looks good. So I'll ladle this evenly over the top of the beef and the green beans. Now for the main attraction, the tots. One of the only things that Nick taught me in the kitchen was that you can't just throw piles of tots onto a hot dish. You have to arrange them in perfect columns and rows so that you get maximum crispiness distribution. Okay, last one, last one, yay. But a good pinch of salt and black pepper. And then it's going in at 450 degrees in the upper third of the oven, which helps the tots get extra crispy, and it'll go for 35 minutes. Oh yeah, that's a hot dish. I'll make it pretty with some fresh parsley. This makes me so happy. Just looking at all of these rows of tots. It's my party, and I'll have a sampling of the hot dish if I want to and ketchup is important. 
on everything in one bite. Mm. The meat is so saucy and flavorful. I am making my brisket hot dish. It is a super thick, meaty, comforting casserole that gets topped with crispy potato smiles. To start, I've got two pounds of brisket cubed up, and I'm seasoning it all over with kosher salt and black pepper, and that's gonna help the brisket develop that brown crust, which is crucial for the flavor. All right, a little more salt and pepper and now we'll get it browning. So I've got my brazier here heating up and I'm just piling this all into it. It's a one pot meal. I'll get some oil heating and get this in, spacing it out evenly to give it some breathing room. That's the sound. If your pan isn't hot enough, you won't get a crust and you won't get that great flavor. I can smell it already too. I'll let this go on medium high for a few minutes on each side until it's browned all over. Okay, this is smelling great. I'll toss in my carrots and celery. The fat from the brisket is gonna get all up into these veggies and make them extra tasty. I've also got some leeks that I've chopped and soaked, rinsed. The flavor of leeks always makes me think of spring. A good pinch of salt to help the vegetables sweat. And stir this around and allow the vegetables to start to soften. This is looking really good. Okay, as the veggies continue to soften, I'll toss in some sliced garlic it around. And now that I'm smelling the garlic, that is my cue to go into the next step, which is to squeeze in two tablespoons of tomato paste. All the best braised briskets have red wine. It adds that delicious, dark, complex flavor. Just a half cup will do. Before I add anything else, I do want to allow the wine to reduce so you're just left with the flavor. The moisture from the wine will loosen up all the bits that are stuck to the bottom of the pan. Those are little tiny flavor bombs left over from browning the brisket, and they are gonna mingle and make this even more delicious. I'll pour in a can of diced tomatoes, two and a half cups of low sodium bee stock to help this come together into a stew. And I'll pour this in just until it's about halfway up the beef. And lastly, some fresh rosemary, that witsy flavor. I'll bring this up to a boil, reduce to a simmer and cook it covered for two hours and then uncovered for another half hour or so so that it can reduce and get saucy and thick. Oh my good gosh, beef, this is gonna be good. It smells like hot dish heaven in here. The stew has thickened and the meat is tender. I'm just using a couple of forks to break up some of these bigger chunks. This is exactly the texture that I'm looking for. Okay, this looks good. I'll grab my tots and peas. I'll toss in some frozen peas just for added freshness and greenery. Fresh or frozen would work. If they're frozen, they'll thaw almost immediately. Okay. And of course you can use any shape tot, but look at how fun the smiley faces are. I'll arrange these in one even layer all over the top, and then stick this in the oven at 400 degrees to bake for 45 to 50 minutes until it's golden brown and bubbly. I'm ready to meet my friends. Get it? Meet. <laughs> ah, look how cute. All right. Just gotta dress them up for dinner with some parsley and chives. Give them a little body glitter, know what I'm saying? <laughs> Russell sprout casserole, which is comforting and decadent, and the whole thing gets covered in crispy, salty onions. Plus, it's a snap to make. I just throw everything into a pot and bake. So I've got this pot heating over medium heat. I'm gonna add a couple of tablespoons of olive oil. I've got my two pounds of Brussels sprouts here that are quartered. And for me, Brussels sprouts have always been the perfect Thanksgiving vegetable, not the green beans. Brussels sprouts are in season in Thanksgiving, so it just makes sense. I'll dump these right in. They're already starting to crackle and pop. And I'll stir them around and just let them get some color all over the outside. These are looking glossy and golden and gorgeous. I'm gonna add four tablespoons of butter now. There is no shortage of butter on Thanksgiving in our house. I'll let this melt. Okay, this smell is Thanksgiving now. It wasn't just Brussels sprouts, it's Brussels sprouts and butter. I've got some leeks, which I've soaked and rinsed, and these will add some nice sweetness. 
This is a lot of veggies, but they all cook down. I'll stir these around and let the leeks soak up that butter. I'll add a sprinkle of salt. I have some pepper. Oh my gosh, it smells so good right now. Thanksgiving perfume, get on it. Okay, while these continue to soften, I'll add some sliced garlic and mm, earthy thyme. There are so many delicious flavors in this dish. Now that my veggies are soft, I'm gonna add three tablespoons of flour. And this is gonna combine with the butter and the oil to create a roux that's gonna thicken up my liquids. And it's gonna make this so creamy. I'm gonna stir this around and let it cook for about a minute so that that flour flavor can cook off. I'll add two cups of low sodium chicken stock and let everything thicken up and get cozy. All right, call me crazy, but I feel like the true MVP of Thanksgiving is heavy cream. It makes the vegetables better. You put it on the pumpkin pie. It's everywhere. I'm stirring an entire cup of heavy cream into this thing. And I've brought it to room temperature just so that it cooks evenly. It was looking great already. Now it's looking great plus. There's so much flavor in my hands right now. I'm gonna add a quarter cup of Parmesan cheese. It's been grated. That just adds that salty umaminess. A couple of teaspoons of Dijon mustard will add that zippiness that makes Brussels sprouts sing. And lastly, some lemon zest. Let me stir this all together. Oh, that cream is really thickened up. This is so decadent. And now for the best part, the crispy fried onions. And I'm not gonna hold back here. I want a thick layer of crunchiness on top. I'll spread these out. This is beautiful. It's gonna get even more beautiful in the oven though. I'm gonna bake it at 400 degrees for 20 minutes until it's golden and bubbly around the edges. I'm gonna need my eating pants for this one. These Brussels sprouts are a good time, if I do say so myself. I'm always up for a good time. <laughs> I am making my meaty ziti with dollops of fresh pesto. To start, I'm browning up a pound of sweet Italian sausage. All right, next I'll add my onion. This is one sliced yellow onion. A pinch of salt. I'll give this a stir and get the onion all coated in that sausage fat. And as this continues to soften, I'm gonna chop up some fennel, which is not typical of a ziti, but because the sausage has fennel in it, this will just kind of echo that flavor. I'll toss this into my brazier. Okay, as my veggies finish up softening, I'll add a little more salt and some crushed red pepper to get that toasting. This smells heavenly already. Now there are a lot of bits stuck to the bottom of my pan. Those harness so much flavor. So I'm gonna loosen them up by pouring in a half cup of red wine. This is called deglazing if you wanna get fancy. So as this gets down to the bottom of the pot, I'm gonna use my spoon to scrape up those bits stuck to the bottom. And those will just infuse even more flavor. I'm gonna let this wine cook off and reduce by about half. All right. I've got one big can of whole peeled tomatoes that I'll add to my mixture, and I'll do it in my hand so that I can break them up. All right, I'll pour in the juices as well. And I'll make it a little saucier with some added tomato sauce too. And a little water. Okay, I'll stir it to bring everything together. I'll bring this to a simmer and then let it cook until it's thick and flavorful. Mm, that is a thick sauce. Those flavors are gonna be super concentrated. I've got a pound of ziti cooking in heavily salted water. I'm gonna transfer it directly from the pot to the sauce. Hello. Look at all these nudes. I'm gonna fold these in now. Okay, this is just about completely combined. I'm gonna continue to fold it as I fold in. Not one, not two but three kinds of cheese. I've got some shredded mozzarella for meltiness. This is two cups. I'm gonna add about half right now so that I can mingle with the pasta. Just make it even richer than it already is with the sausage. 
and then some fresh mozzarella for creaminess and leave it in some bigger chunks so that you get little pools of cheese. And lastly, some Parmesan, which brings saltiness to the party. Sprinkle in about a quarter cup. And then I'm reserving these cheeses to add more on top as well so that they can get brown and crusty on the top. Oh my gosh, that mozzarella is already getting melty. I'll finish off my ziti with a little more parm, shredded mozzarella, and big tears of the fresh stuff too. Okay, this is ready to bake. I'll stick it in at 425 degrees for about 20 to 25 minutes until it's bubbly around the edges and splotchy on top. Okay, it's ziti time. It smells insane in here. Uh, yeah, look at that. Look at all those crispy noodles standing up in those pools of cheese. Somehow this is gonna get better and it's because of the pesto dollops. Black pepper. And what the heck, more Parmesan. I cannot physically stand over this without eating some immediately. Oh, this is cheese pull. Hello. Oh. The brightness of the pesto cuts the richness of everything else so perfectly. This is so good. Spiced beef hot dish with bacon jalapeno cornbread. To get started, I'm crisping up some bacon because I'm gonna use the bacon fat to brown my beef. And I'm doing this all in a brazier that's gonna get stuck in the oven. So this all is built in one pot. My bacon is looking really crispy. I'll transfer it to a paper towel. I'll season my beef now. I have three pounds of beef chuck that's been cut into cubes. Now I'm gonna brown this in batches. And that is the sizzle that I want to hear. If I add too much meat, it's gonna lower the temperature of the pan and I'm not gonna get that crust. So just be patient with this. This stew is inspired by my love of making chili and cornbread in this same pot. Okay, my meat is looking great right now. It's really beautifully browned. I'm gonna transfer this to a dish now and then I'm gonna continue browning the rest of my meat. And at this point, it's not fully cooked, but it's gonna continue to cook once I get it in the stew. And then it'll melt right down and get so tender. My meat is finished, time for my veggies. I'll add my chopped onion, carrot, and jalapeno. And the carrot is gonna add really nice sweetness. So I'm gonna add a whole jalapeno here, and then I'll reserve the other jalapeno for my cornbread later. I'll add a pinch of salt. And then I'll stir this around and let these get soft. Okay, my veggies are glossy and soft. I've got chili powder and baharat, which is a Middle Eastern spice blend. Baharat translates to spices in Arabic, and it's heavy on the savory spices, like cumin and coriander, and there's some smokiness with paprika. And then there's also this gorgeous warmth by way of nutmeg and allspice, things that I feel like are underutilized with meats. I'm gonna add a tablespoon of this and then a teaspoon of chili powder for some heat. I'll also add two cloves of minced garlic. And I'll let my spices toast for a minute or two. Mmm, it is smelling so good in here already. And if you don't have baharat, you can pull a few of the spices that are in it and play with the flavors. Or you can use a different spice blend and take yourself on a different flavor journey. Garam masala would be really good with this. Or you can just go straight chili powder. The world is your stew oyster. <laughs> Those spices smell great. I'm ready to add my tomatoes. I have a 14 ounce can of fire roasted tomatoes, just extra smokiness, and 14 ounces of beef stock. It's not actually that much liquid because this stew is gonna be really thick and hearty. And now the liquid is loosening all of those tasty bits at the bottom of the pan. So I'm gonna scrape those up and make sure they get incorporated. I'll add my beef back in. And these pieces, once this is done cooking, are gonna fall apart and be so tender. Now I'm gonna add one of my favorite parts about this stew, golden raisins. I know, this is unexpected, but golden raisins add these surprise pops of sweet glee that go with the baharat and make it sing. I'm gonna add half a cup of golden raisins. And they're gonna plump up in this liquid and get juicy and become almost like meaty candy, which is a good thing. 
And lastly, a couple of cans of chickpeas. And these had a creamy richness and also more protein. <laughs> Nick is gonna love it. Let me stir this in. I love that this all comes together in the same pot. This is so beautiful. I also love all the colors in this and the textures. And I'll season with some more salt and pepper. And then I'm gonna simmer this for one to one and a half hours and let the flavors marry and this meat get fall apart tender. I can't wait. The only thing left to do is prepare my cornbread topping. This cornbread is fluffy and moist and it has extra richness from my bacon. I'm gonna start by combining my dry ingredients. I've got one cup of cornmeal, one cup of all-purpose flour, one teaspoon of kosher salt, one teaspoon of baking powder, but baking soda has to ruin everything because I'm just gonna add half a teaspoon of baking soda. But it gets a pass because it's gonna make this cornbread extra fluffy. And I'll whisk to combine. My dry ingredients are combined. Next, I'll whisk up my wet ingredients. I've got my egg, honey, and Greek yogurt. And the yogurt is gonna add some tenderness and tanginess. I'll start by cracking in my egg. One tablespoon of honey will add the perfect bit of sweetness and plain whole milk Greek yogurt. And lastly, I have a stick of butter that's melted and cooled slightly because I don't want it to cook the egg. And I'll whisk to combine. Looks great. I'll add this to the dry ingredients now. And my chopped jalapeno, this is gonna be really pretty and speckled in the cornbread and it'll add that great heat and my crispy bacon. I'll give this a rough chop and toss it right into the bowl. Oh, I should have made more so I could eat it right now. I'm getting really hungry. And I'll fold it all together and that's it. This looks great. Now I'm gonna dollop it all over my stew. It smells heavenly. All right, I've got my scoop for the cornbread and I'm gonna dollop my cornbread all over the top. And then bake it at 400 degrees for 25 to 30 minutes until it's golden brown. I can feel the comfort already. Oh yeah, baby. It's bubbly and that cornbread is so toasty. Before I serve it, I'll sprinkle it with some fresh parsley. I am making my chicken Alfredo lasagna. It's creamy and rich and super indulgent. It's basically the cozy flannel sheet version of lasagna. To start, I've got a couple of chicken breasts cooking in my skillet here, and I've seasoned them with some Italian seasonings for extra flavor. You could also just go a shortcut route and use a rotisserie chicken from the store. I'll transfer these to a pan. I'll set these aside while I make my Alfredo sauce. I'll do it in the same skillet where I just cooked the chicken. I'm gonna add six tablespoons of butter. Get down. As the butter melts, I'll scrape the pan to get those chicken bits incorporated because those harbor a lot of flavor. And add in six cloves of minced garlic. I'll let this cook just for about a minute or two so that the garlic can soften. And when I can really start to smell it, that's how I know it's ready to move to the next step. Garlic and butter is the key to a good Alfredo. I'm gonna add some flour now, which is gonna help to thicken my sauce. Two tablespoons is all I need. And the butter with the flour together is gonna create a roux, and that's gonna thicken up some milk and heavy cream so that it's just extra rich. I love lasagna made with a bechamel type sauce like this. Now I'm gonna add two cups of whole milk mixed with one cup of heavy cream. I'll pour this in gradually as I mix continuously until it starts to get luxurious. This is looking really creamy and dreamy. It hasn't reached its full thickness yet, but it's gonna continue to thicken up once I add my cheese. I've got shredded parm, which is gonna load it up on flavor. And in my creamy sauces, I love a little bit of nutmeg. It'll cozy it up. I'll just grate in a little bit. And then I'll mix in two and a half cups of freshly grated Parmesan for loads of flavor. I'll sprinkle in about half of it and whisk it in until it melts. I'll add in a little more and I'm gonna save some for the top. Okay, I'm gonna add lots of black pepper. 
And the Parmesan is pretty salty, so I don't need to add more salt. Give it a taste. Yes, that is perfect. All right, I'll just keep this on low while I chop up my chicken. Normally I'm super opposed to chicken and cheese. I don't think that they go well together. But chicken and parm and a little bit of mozzarella in this, I make an exception for. My chicken's all cubed up. I'll also chop up some parsley. It'll be really pretty and green. That's some fiber. Gotta have something green in there. Okay, to put this decadent lasagna together. I've got a butter casserole dish, some shredded mozzarella for meltiness, and no boil lasagna noodles. I'm gonna start with a layer of sauce in my dish. I'll spread it all over the bottom. I'll lay down three noodles, spacing them out evenly. And they expand a little bit in the oven. I'll add another layer of sauce, make them extra cozy. I'll sprinkle on some chicken, the mozzarella. Lasagna is all about the textures. You have the creamy sauce, melty mozzarella, noodly noodles, and that juicy tender chicken. Ugh, all in one bite. A little parsley. And I'll just repeat this two more times. Nick grew up eating a lot of Italian food because he was on the cross country team. The night before a meet, they would have pasta parties. I'll finish with my remaining Parmesan. Oh yeah, just enough cheese. All right, this is ready for the oven. I'll stake it in at 350 degrees for 40 to 50 minutes until the cheese is super melty and the noodles are tender. I'm gonna crush this. Mmm, this is delicious. There is no denying the convenience of a solid one-pot meal, especially during hectic times. Something that's flavorful and filling and impossible to mess up. So today, that is exactly what I'm making. It's my busy day hot dish, and it's meaty and hearty and covered in curly fries. I'm gonna start by melting four tablespoons of butter into my pot here. I'll add in two pounds of ground beef. I'll season it with a teaspoon of kosher salt. And I'll cook it over medium high, breaking it up with my spoon until it's browned. While the beef finishes up browning, I'll chop up my veggies. I've got a red bell pepper. If you don't like red bell pepper, you could do carrots, onions, celery, anything. Just get the veggies in, because this is about to get covered in cheese fries, so you gotta have something for balance. I've also got a few stalks of scallions, which will add nice freshness. Okay, I'll toss these in and let them get soft. I'm gonna reserve a few of the scallion greens to get sprinkled on at the end. These veggies are soft. I'm gonna add some corn for little bites of sweetness, and fresh or frozen would both work. And if it's frozen, it thaws pretty much immediately when it hits this dish. I'll stir this right in. I'm gonna season this with two teaspoons of paprika, which will add a little smoky heat. And some black pepper. These are some good smells. I'm gonna add a third of a cup of all-purpose flour now. I'll stir this around and let the flour flavor cook off for a minute or two. And the combination of the flour and the butter that I added at the beginning creates a roux, and that's gonna thicken up my chicken stock to create the creamy sauce that binds this hot dish together. Okay, I'm ready to add the stock. I'm gonna add two and a half cups of low sodium chicken stock gradually as I stir so that the sauce can be extra smooth. And you can use homemade or store-bought stock here. This is looking saucy. I'll stir in half a cup of heavy cream. And then a tablespoon of Dijon mustard will add the perfect hit of punchiness. Mm -mm -mm. This just got real. I'll sprinkle in some fresh parsley, dill, and thyme to really give this hot dish some herbiness. Oh yeah, it's bubbly and thick. Mmm. I'm almost ready for my fries. Before I top, I want to taste to make sure that all the seasonings are where I want them to be. Mmm. Mmm. I don't know how it could even get better. 
Oh, wait, yes, I do. By covering it in fries. Look at this mountain of fries. And a lot of them are gonna overlap. So then you get all these different textures. There are the fries on the bottom that soak up the hot dish mixture, and then the ones on top that get crispy. I'm very excited. Next, I'm gonna top it with cheese. And Swiss cheese goes beautifully with all of these brighter flavors. I love it. But any melty cheese will do. I'm gonna stick this in the oven at 400 degrees for about 40 minutes until the fries are crispy and the cheese is melty. <laughs> Look at those crispy curly fries. I can't wait to dig into this. I'm gonna finish it with my reserved scallions. Oh, I have to taste it. It's meaty, it's cheesy, there are hidden veggies. This has everything going for it. I'm making my taco hot dish. It's out of this world. I've got half of a white onion sizzling in my pan and a lot of pinch of salt. I'll stir this around. And I'll let my onions cook for a few minutes to soften. It's already smelling good in here. As these cook, I'll grab my jalapeno and bell pepper. These are gonna add some nice color to the dish. I'll chop these up too. I'm removing the seeds from my jalapeno. I don't want it to be too spicy. Taco hot dish is totally a Midwest thing. A hot dish is a type of casserole that's a meal in a dish. It's gotta have a protein, a starch, a veggie, and something to bind it all together, like a cream soup, or today I'm using salsa. I love these bright colors. It's already a fiesta. While these continue to cook, I'll grab my other ingredients. I've got my corn chips, which will be the crunchy topping, my mild salsa, which will hold everything together, and taco seasoning, which will add loads of flavor. Taco seasoning is heavy on the cumin, the chili powder, and onion powder, and it's gonna be so good. I usually just buy mine, but you could also make your own. I'll add this to the pan with my veggies. It's gonna start to smell even better in here. I'll stir this around because I want my spices to toast. It'll bring out more flavor. I'm smelling that chili powder. As the spices continue to toast, I'll grab my beef and corn. I love this dish. Everything just gets added to the same pan. It's so easy. I'll break this up with my spoon and brown it all over. My meat is browning nicely now. Okay, I'm ready to add some black beans. Gotta have beans. These have been drained and rinsed. And some corn. Fresh or frozen will both do. I'm using frozen. It'll thaw almost immediately when I pour it in. This will add little morsels of sweetness. I'll stir this in and allow the heat to heat up the corn and beans. Oh, look at all these fun colors. You could put this into a tortilla and eat it like a taco. But to hot dish it, I'm gonna add something to bind it all together, my salsa. I'll stir it together. I'm almost done. That was so easy. And I barely have to clean anything. That's a win. My filling is set, and now I'm going to add the crunchy topping. Corn chips, heck yeah. They're gonna be gorgeous on top, they're gonna add great crunch, and they're gonna get even more crunchy in the oven. Oh, oh. This is my favorite excuse to buy corn chips at the store. Okay, the hard part is over. I'm gonna stick this in the oven now at 375 for about 20 minutes and let everything come together. This is gonna be the most comforting form of tacos ever. I can smell my taco hot dish. I think it's ready. Oh yeah. This looks awesome. I love the way some of the corn chips soak up the juices. They're crispy on top and a little soft on the bottom. For some colorful pops of freshness, I'm gonna finish this with some crumbled queso fresco. This will add some great salty snaps. I'll also add some sliced radishes. These will add a peppery bite and they look like confetti on top. A few lime wedges that my guests can squeeze on themselves. This will add a hit of acidity. I love squeezing limes on my tacos. And I'll sprinkle with some chopped fresh cilantro. Okay, I don't think anybody is gonna notice if I steal a chip. Mmm, this bursts with flavor. 